Hello, I'm Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm a head of Bluestack Productions, publisher of Irish Environment, an online magazine covering environmental matters on the island of Ireland. And I'm happy to be here in Dublin today with Oshin Coughlin. Hello, Oshin. Good to be with you. Uh, some of you may have seen an earlier version of uh, an interview between myself and Oshin um, uh, talking about the work of the Friends of the Earth several years ago. Um, and uh, we've asked Oshin to come back today <coughs> to talk about the National Mitigation Plan from the government, uh, which is in part the focus of a group called Stop Climate Chaos, which also involves Friends of the Earth. <coughs> so what is Stop Climate Chaos, Oshin? So Stop Climate Chaos is a coalition of civil society organizations uh, that's been around for 10 years campaigning for Ireland to do its fair share on climate change. Uh, and it includes environmental organizations like ourselves, on Tashka, uh, and it includes overseas aid and development organizations like Trokra, mm -hmm. and Concern, and Christian Aid, and Oxfam. Mm -hmm. And the National Youth Council is there, uh, and some other uh, youth organizations, and some faith based organizations. So it's a broad civil society coalition mm -hmm. uh, for Ireland to do its fair share on climate change. Mm -hmm. And the environmental community is uh, kind of one of the moving forces behind this, correct? Yeah, I guess you could say it was in, initially it is a coalition between the environmental organizations uh -huh. and the development organizations, the overseas aid organizations, who are bigger. Uh, and actually have been very committed to this cause over the years. The, yes. uh, as, 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 as any of your regular uh, viewers and readers will know, <laughs> the environmental sector is a small sector in Ireland, under-resourced. We tried to punch above our weight, mm -hmm. but it's why we were so uh, happy to be able to form a coalition with some of the household names of, of the Irish, of Irish civil society, like Throcra, like mm -hmm. Oxfam, like Christian Aid. And they, over the years, have remained very committed and have really boosted the impact of, uh, of, of this coalition and of our action on climate change. And um, now the National Mitigation Plan, uh, which the draft was just published uh, recently in March. That's correct. Yes. Um, uh, where did it come from? What, what came before it? So this is actually Ireland's fourth attempt, uh, or not even attempt, fourth time that we've put together a plan to contain or reduce our, our climate pollution. The first was in 1994, or 93, sorry, just in response to signing the, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, in, in Rio in, 20, in 1982. Mm -hmm. Then we produced one in the year 2000 in response to um, having signed the Kyoto uh, Protocol under that convention. And then we produced one in 2007 uh, to prepare for the actual commitment period under Kyoto from 2008 to 2012. So the last one, actually, I have it here, uh, is the National Climate Change Strategy 2007 to 2012, mm -hmm. which was how we were going to meet our Kyoto targets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it expired in 2012, and here we are five years later, and we still don't have a new plan. There's no new action plan. Mm -hmm. And finally, after like four years of, con of consultations, mm -hmm. uh, the government has produced a draft plan, which <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it up for your viewers. <laughs> Uh, it's not of the races compared to the other two. It just doesn't have the, bo the meat on the bones. It doesn't have the, uh, the, the, the new actions. It makes no decisions. It's really more like a menu of options than it is like a plan. Now, that's the first really disappointing thing, is that it's not a draft plan. Mm -hmm. It's a consultation document at best. And after five years of waiting, uh -huh. that's a disappointment. And what, what does it, does it offer anything concrete? Well, I'm sure if the minister was here, he would take you through a lot of the things it talks about. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for us, the, the principal thing is that it isn't making any decisions. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, uh, mentioning things that could be done and sort mm -hmm. of telling us where they are and thinking about them and how, and how they intend to keep thinking about them for some time to come mm -hmm. before finally making a decision. Mm -hmm. And that would have been fine five, or actually would have been fine ten years ago. Mm -hmm. But now, when we're more than halfway through our target period for, for at the moment under EU under EU targets for uh -huh. 2020, we're producing a discussion document rather than an action plan mm -hmm. as to how to meet those targets. In fact, it looks like the government's given up on meeting those 2020 targets. That's really inadequate. You asked where this, this comes from. I've given you the kind of broader history, but specifically, mm -hmm. it's a result of the climate change law that we that we got passed after campaigning by Stop Climate Chaos uh, and Friends of the Earth mm -hmm. in 2015. The only reason we're getting this at all after this five-year delay is because there's now a legal requirement for the Minister for the Environment to uh -huh. produce uh, a plan and submit it to government before the 10th of June 2017. Uh -huh. I think if there, if they, if we hadn't won the climate change law, they wouldn't even do it now. Uh -huh. They would avoid because they try. All this is is trying to avoid making any hard decisions about climate action. But they have to come up with a plan now because of the climate law. And I must say, your your statements in the press have been very critical, of course. And, and Toshkis was, and even the Irish Times looked at this document and said. The document is staggeringly non-committal in terms of any concrete plans or proposals to achieve the goals. 
There's a bewildering plethora of reviews, reports, consultations, scoping exercises, Mickey Mouse pilot programs, and cost-benefit analysis. The common thread is in action for the foreseeable future. I, That's I, a pretty tough statement from I the Irish Times. I couldn't put it better myself. And what, what is stopping them from, from doing something? I mean, I think it's a mindset, first of all, and then I think it's, it's also uh, vested interests. But the mindset's almost more perfidious. It's that, you know, Ireland's a small country and, oh, this, this action would cost us money in the short term. And it, this is somebody, this is a global problem, uh -huh. which, is, which in Irish, in Irish policy making is a short term for somebody else's problem. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we're too small, don't mind us. Mm -hmm. and that's, that would be, like, you might have some sympathy for that, except that we are the uh, eighth most polluting country per person in the OECD, mm -hmm. in the rich world. We're the eighth most polluting country in the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no one's asking Ireland to do more than our fair share. No one's mm -hmm. asking us to, to, to reduce actually more emissions mm -hmm. than other than, 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 than bigger countries. But we are asking us ourselves mm -hmm. to do our fair share. And this document and this government and this administration, the administrative state, mm -hmm. has no desire to do our fair share because mm -hmm. that involves discommoding vested interests in the short term. And this is one of the big problems. The, the, benefit, the beneficiaries of climate action mm -hmm. are the population at large who might have lower fuel bills or warmer homes or ultimately cleaner air and ultimately a safer climate. Mm -hmm. But the people who are disadvantaged by climate action are you know, fossil fuel companies, are the big agribusiness companies in Ireland. And they're mm -hmm. vocal, they're organised, they're concentrated, and they have a lot of influence on, uh, on public policy. And the lesson they have, uh, they have taken from that is not we must lead better, we must engage more, we must mm -hmm. win the arguments, it's we mustn't do anything to annoy people, we mustn't frighten the horses, particularly mm -hmm. post-recession and as we're moving into recovery and looking and jobs is the only thing we care, short-term jobs is all we care about, mm -hmm. there's no desire to actually take big decisions or even to put big decisions out there with, with a government perspective attached to them, mm -hmm. like we, you know, there's no proposal here to shut money point or to close down peak stations, it's like what would you think if we thought about possibly maybe doing this in 10 years time? Yeah. Now, to take peat for an example, peat is the most inefficient way to produce electricity. Right. It produces 9% of Ireland's electricity and 22% of our pollution from mm -hmm. electricity in a carbon sense, in a climate sense, yeah. while also being bad for the air quality around Ireland and yeah. for asthma and everything else. And the Irish government was first told to stop burning peat for electricity if it wanted to meet its climate targets in 1998. Mm -hmm. They signed Kyoto in 97. They asked, in preparing its first climate strategy, they asked for ex outside experts, not environmentalists, uh -huh. to figure out what to do. And they were told, stop burning peat, stop burning gas and money point, and do a carbon tax. Uh -huh. And they immediately dropped the idea of peat. It didn't even make it into the 2000 plan. Mm -hmm. And they've been faffing about it ever since on peat. But now, Oshin, how do you overcome those vested interests, primarily the agricultural sector in this country? I don't think, first of all, I don't think the vested interests are only agriculture. I think they are the ESB, they are uh, Board of Mona, they uh -huh. are also the agribusiness. It's not just, unfortunately, the vested interests aren't just in the agribusiness sector. Uh -huh. they're, they're also in transport, for example, and they're also in the, the, uh, the, 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 the officials in some of the departments who see short-term costs and, and don't accept the long-term uh, risks and the long-term gains that, uh -huh. that we face otherwise. So it isn't just agriculture that, that where there are vested interests. Where are they in transport, the vested interests? Um, I think they are, I mean, broadly across transport and other bits of government, they are in people who look at a spreadsheet and say, oh, it would cost us uh, X amount of money right now to invest, to invest in public transport or to invest in retrofitting, uh -huh. and how do we pay for that? and oh well the benefits there further down the road they're harder to measure and mm -hmm. avoided climate climate uh, impacts mm -hmm. we don't have really any metrics for that uh, so we'll just look at the cost and the cost of acting mm -hmm. is quite high right now we see compared to not investing at all mm -hmm. and therefore really we should be cautious we should wait and see maybe some other technology will come along mm -hmm. there is of course also the more general disposition on it over the years over the decades to invest in roads over public transport right. and that that um, disposition hasn't been fundamentally uh -huh. uh, changed over the last five years. It's been held back a bit by the recession, mm -hmm. but there's no significant indication here that the government intends to have a major shift uh -huh. from um, private transport to public transport. So far, it's always kicking the can down the road. We mm -hmm. need to, we, we, we haven't since the carbon tax was introduced in 2009 for 2010 mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that was done around the same time around renewables we've seen no big decisions mm -hmm. that actually moves a carbon reduction agenda forward mm -hmm. and this document doesn't have them either no decisions lots of 
consultations, lots of chat. Now, the, the transport is, of course, a major 20-some percent of the, of the emissions. I, is there any movement on behalf of people who use transport to address that and overcome? Because you're talking about the ministers as being the vested interest. I, is there any vested interest within the use of transport? I th well, you, you, are, you are seeing increasing um, uh, activism from uh, walkers and cyclists, for okay. the, led by the cyclists, I think, because there has been an uptake, partly because of the recession, partly because of, of Dublin bike schemes and other schemes like that around the country, you are seeing a resurgence of cycling. Okay. And that, that leads, that, that kind of builds the constituency there, or, or you could say a vested interest, or an interest group at least, uh -huh. and they are now complaining much more loudly about the lack of cycling infrastructure in Ireland, other okay. some improvements. And they are complaining about, you know, the, the safe, related to that, the safety issues, there's been five fatalities in Dublin this year alone. Uh -huh. uh, so that's become, a, 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 there was a thousand people on the streets recently for a cycling protest, that's not bad for uh -huh. Ireland. So there's some pressure there. Uh -huh. I think where we'll see it though, where it'll really break into the public discourse, unfortunately, this is the way it happens in Ireland, is, is congestion, mm -hmm. traffic congestion. Right. Uh, you know, the M50 is becoming already, having been widened to, th to, th to three lanes uh, uh, each way. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's, it's already reaching capacity again, mm -hmm. but it's only told at one point. And um, we're seeing transport like after again, if we, you know, you're talk we're talking in the city centre in Dublin. I, I was very conscious in 2010, 11, 12, there was a big, you could see it as I cycled to work, a big fall off in city traffic. It's going right back up again now. Yeah. So uh, that will cause pressure on public policymakers to solve that problem. The case, uh -huh. the question would be, do they try to, you know, expand more roads, or more roads and right. more traffic again? I, actually, I don't think they can. I right. think the M50 is really can't be widened again. Yeah. Or do they look to actually control traffic right. and expand public transport. And we need a congestion charge on the canals. We need yeah. to, as has been a great success in London, uh -huh. that, would, that would begin to sh the shift to public transport and to bicycles, which was there a bit in the recession, certainly on bicycles, but it'll be overwhelmed by cars again. And if we do that, there'll be less road space, there'll be less people who come off the bikes again for, for, for safety reasons. Uh -huh. So, you know, there are there's things that could be done, but they, they involve uh -huh. a, 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 a minister and a government standing up to vested interests. Now, you, there, you mentioned there is some movement amongst the people for, for cycling and so forth. Is there any similar movement in the uh, building efficiency sector in terms of that? Everybody, even the mitigation plan, says this is the easiest, simplest, yes. Yeah. most sensible thing to do, they don't suggest doing anything about it, yeah. but is there any movement? Because that is the simple solution. I think, in a funny way, things have gone backwards. Oddly, it's one, it's an area where I have a tiny bit of sympathy for the government's rationale for an action so far, which yeah. is that it doesn't, it didn't, it would have required investment. Right. And we had no money uh, mm -hmm. in, five years ago when this should have been, when this should have been, been done. Uh -huh. But it's a real pity. I mean, actually, this goes back to, you know, if the, if at a European level, the, uh, the crisis, financial crisis have been dealt with differently and we'd had a Keynesian response of investing rather than one of austerity. Mm -hmm. This could have been a really big area because you could have invested and you could have kept the builders from emigration, you could have kept the builders in jobs, you could have, you know, by doing retrofitting mm -hmm. and you could have had lower, you know, lower fuel bills, warmer right. homes, lower emissions, emissions and kept jobs. Uh -huh. But to be fair, the government didn't have the money itself. It did try for a while to look at innovative schemes mm -hmm. to kind of leverage private finance through banks and so on and utility companies like ESB and so on. It's not a, it's, it's a really, it's easy to talk about and there's right. these schemes like pay as you save so that mm -hmm. the, the utility company pays for your retrofitting, for your upgrading of your house and you pay back over a number of years. It's easy to say it. Mm -hmm. I have to admit it is difficult to figure it out in practice. They tried in Britain and failed. Yeah. But now that, that those restraints aren't the same. But now what's the government doing? It's a bit like you know, Sarah Palin and drill, baby, drill. Now the mantra is build, baby, build because of the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And there's very little ap appetite for anything that might cause builders pause before building. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, and this, the, the, the building standards aren't too bad, but there, but there have been efforts to kind of, you know, lock them down and improve them in, ver in various councils, which local councils, which in fact the gov central government have been resisting because all they care about right now is building more houses. Mm -hmm. And that's problematic. We built a third of our houses during the last boom. Right to poor environmental standards, right. uh, and indeed poor other sorts of standards like pyrite and, and the rest of it. Right. And we should, must learn that lesson. You know, people have a problem with climate change. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to think 35 years ahead, which is a, sure. the timeline now for all this action being done. Uh -huh. But one of the places where people do think that far ahead is in houses. We, get, we take out 25, 30 year mortgages. We, have mm -hmm. a, we associate houses and owning houses with long-term planning. Mm -hmm. 
so therefore in houses last not just 35 years they last for 50 100 years so mm -hmm. every house we build now mm -hmm. needs to be future proofed against the performance standards we need in 2050 mm -hmm. and that means they need to be zero carbon they just need to be zero carbon yeah. all houses built now need to be zero carbon and that's not quite what the government's at and some of the flooding is at least moving up the time scale for people yeah, I think, I mean, way. we saw the fodder crisis a few years ago, right. we've seen, uh, absolutely, we've seen, uh, I think if you ask people, first of all, just on, even before you get to the flooding, on the weather patterns, right. the fact that we get um, uh, more intense rainfall episodes right. more often, I think people appreciate and, uh, that, that's, that it's not the way it was when we, when we were children, so to speak, mm -hmm. my, I'm in my 40s, our, our generation, we know something, something is changing. Flooding events that were every 50 or 100 years are, hap are look like they're happening every 20 or every 5 right. years. Right. Uh, and we appreciate the impacts of that. I don't think it always translates, though, into the, the macro policy around climate change. What it does right. translate into is pressure for help with home insurance. Right. Maybe into, oh, we shouldn't have built on floodplains. But right. it also translates into, let's drive the Shannon, let's just get the water into the sea, which is also <laughs> rising, of course. Like, yeah. Because people respond to the immediate crisis in front of them. Yeah. They don't always have the headspace or the interest, in, in all the sense that they were the vested interest or the, or the public interest to pull mm -hmm. back and say, actually, what would stop this happening right. in, in 20 years time and that's why public interest organizations like friends of the earth and like the, the climate change stop climate against coalition that's why we exist to try and right. exert that public interest perspective on these debates if the national government is doing nothing and it seems very clear it's doing nothing um, can you work with the cities and in, in certainly in the states and in europe um, there are many places where the cities because the national government is not doing enough the cities are taking uh, very proactive, you know, act, you know, work in terms of measures. Is that possible here? Is there any attempts have been made to work with the cities? I mean, I think it's challenging in Ireland, and I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. But I want to just agree with your with your uh, proposition initially. I think act cities are an arena where you can get real, really effective action for for a couple of reasons. One is kind of the scale is right. Like in your local village or, or on your own, there's some things you can do, but obviously unless lots of people do it, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to have an impact. Um, and often for people, as I've just kind of been describing, public national policy, public policy is a bit too far away, a bit too abstract, right. unless it's fracking or something, they don't, it, it doesn't resonate with them. Uh -huh. Whereas people do, people who live in cities do identify with the city and do want to see their city do well. And mm -hmm. uh, it is a scale that people can relate to still mm -hmm. and engage with, but it is also a scale that can have an impact. In Ireland, there aren't that many cities at scale, in a sense. I mean, you know, Dublin is, is, is kind of predominant, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's, there's, there's Cork and Limerick uh, and mm -hmm. Galway and so on, but, the, right. but the, it isn't the same, there isn't the same number of them, and, and our, our overall national polity is too small for, that, for the cities to be able to play that leading role. But actually, the, more, the, the bigger problem is that cities don't have the right, the, the, the appropriate or necessary level of autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can't really move ahead uh, in, in the way that US cities can without national uh, uh, approval. Do, do um, cities have control over the building regulations? They, they try, uh -huh. but actually it's not, it's not necessarily cities as a whole, it's the individual council. So in, our, right. so in Dublin, for example, there's four, I think it's four, uh, right. um, or, or, yeah, four councils. And there's some exa interesting examples here. So like the last time um, um, uh, standards improved, they were improved very ultimately nationally by 2009, uh -huh. but the impetus came from a couple of councils in Dublin uh -huh. who, uh, who led the way and put, put higher than national standards in place in their local council areas. Uh -huh. And a similar movement is afoot recently with uh, F uh, Fingal in North County Dublin and Dunleary Rathdown in South County Dublin, uh, actually so, so there's five councils, um, uh, are proposing essentially passive house standard as uh -huh. being the way of meeting the building regulations. Uh, but what's the response of national government? Is, is, is been to, try to the minister for the environment, the previous mm -hmm. one, wrote to them and said, "Don't do that. We might take action against you if you do that." But essentially, they're saying if you move ahead of national standards at a time when we're trying to build more and more houses uh -huh. and kickstart uh, development again, uh -huh. we will move against you. We'll take action against you. Now, whether they will actually do that, take action, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's been the attitude. The attitude hasn't been, "Oh, this is interesting." pathfinding, interesting, inter interesting pioneering by these councils, let's mm -hmm. see if we can translate that to a national level. It's been to clamp down on them and try to get them to stop. But basically, the, the, so that's an example of, of, of an attempt to move ahead right. and, a, mm -hmm. and a clamp down from national government against action. But right. the other big challenge is there's a lack of elected mayor. You know, if Dublin had an mm -hmm. elected mayor like New York uh -huh. does or San Francisco, uh -huh a city of a million people, then you do have some scale to move ahead. Uh -huh. But the efforts to, to, do, to get an elected mayor so far 
um, uh, not succeeded. Shall we say. Has there been any, any effort by the, those councils who were kind of instructed or, or put pressured by the national government not to do this to push back? And yeah. say no. It's our if the citizens are town and councils want it. Um, I don't think that battle between those councils and, and the national government is over here. I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think they've completely backed off it. I think there's maybe some uh, some way forward for them. What's been interesting recently is that both the EPA and the newly established Climate Change Advisory Council under the Climate Change Law mm -hmm. are both saying in their most recent reports what is required is a transformation. Right. So at least that, that, that bit of public debate is there, but, but there's been no, that hasn't translating into any sort of a sustained media or poli public policy debate mm -hmm. about what that looks like. And if you had that sort of some more supportive um, national debate, mm -hmm. then it's easier for the individual uh, councils or the individual mm -hmm. actors to, uh, to push for action and to withstand any, any backlash. Uh -huh. um, but we haven't achieved that yet. Now, the government minister has, a, has proposed this national dialogue on climate change, right. and it's going to also be a topic at the Citizens' Assembly in July. Uh -huh. And you can only, we can only hope, and indeed work, for those to become uh, sources of a new discourse, uh, yes. sources of affirmation and validation uh -huh. for action. Um, and you know, if we can achieve that, well, then it becomes every individual, a bit like the climate law itself, it doesn't win you the battles in the first place, right. but it changes the framework in which you're fighting for them. As I said, I don't think we'd have a plan at all if it wasn't for the climate yeah. law. Every minister now has to, not every, every relevant minister, so there's four of them, mm -hmm. have to come to the door every year and, and be accountable for their progress right. or lack of progress. Uh, so it, it, it is more difficult for the government to get away with what they've been getting away with over the last five years mm -hmm. than it was. Politicians are always saying to us, um, but it's not an issue on the doorstep. It doesn't happen on the doorstep. Yeah. And that may be true because people yes. have more pressing, uh, immediate concerns. Yeah. But our response has been, yeah, and I'm sure banking regulation wasn't an issue on the doorstep in 2002 right. or even in 2007. But the signs from experts and from people advising you of an overheating economy were there. Right. And if you paid attention to them, your voters would have been very right. grat grat grateful and would have voted you back in if, uh -huh. if you had taken the lead from the evidence that was there. And it's very right. similar now. The evidence of an overheating planet and of the impacts that that would have and the risks that that has for us as in Ireland mm -hmm. are absolutely evident and yet there's no very little leadership from politicians mm -hmm. so I think we don't you know we're not going to get 50% of the population on the streets but I think mm -hmm. if we do mobilize and there was 5,000 people on the streets before the Paris climate march before the Paris talks mm -hmm. uh, 15 months ago you know if we and we had you know uh, 2,500 people e contacted their TDs before the debate on fracking mm -hmm. in the Doyle that that's led to this progress this legislation progressing yeah. so you, it is possible to get that sort of citizen engagement uh, certainly when they see the threat like fracking uh -huh. we need to translate that into the more uh, you know into, into the kind of positive steps required say around solar electricity uh -huh. or around peace or around money point right. or around climate action more generally and I think if we can build that uh -huh. uh, uh, that action uh, then we'll see politicians follow. Not that, I, not that I'm letting politicians off the hook saying, wait until we come for you before right. you act. Yeah. But you know, if they don't act, we will come for them. And I'm always going to end an interview on a positive note. Thanks, Rasheen, for talking with us. Thank you very much.